Okay, very good. So, um, uh, well, thank you. Good morning, or rather, good day to everybody because we have people from several several time zones here today. And uh, so, um, we have uh, this is uh, Sunday morning at ICSS. Um, and it's an institute that was formed in 2004 at Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library, which is our home base. We're not, we're going to return to it shortly. COVID dislodged us from there. Um, we believe uh, in the works of Karl Marx, who said in his 11th thesis, the uh, philosophers have interpreted the word in different ways. The point, however, is to change it and change the world has we have been attempting and that's what marx onwards those who believed in marxist teachings have been doing and uh, prominent among them you know are are of course his associate um, engels and then lenin and so forth so um and the uh, yet the 20th century socialism has also had setbacks and it's it's uh, we we admit we have to admit that things went wrong in soviet union and had impacted the whole world we're fortunate to have uh, with us today and actually at my house i'm very privileged to have um, professor grover fur who's who has been researching this subject from 1970s and has uh, but his first, I came in contact with him in 2011 uh, with uh, his book, Khrushchev Light. And since then, he has written a number of books which have been published in probably 14, 13 or 14 languages, translated into 13 or 14 languages, uh, four in India itself, one in China and several in European languages. So, um, uh, today's his topic is uh, 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 what what should uh, sorry uh, the crisis of Soviet history of the Stalin period and what should we do about it so um, with that brief introduction please welcome uh, Grover Fur Professor Grover Fur thank you can you all hear me nod your heads if you can hear me. Yes, okay, somebody hears me, that's great. So uh, I'm gonna read this, I wrote it out, uh, just to make things uh, uh, go more smoothly. I don't like to ad lib. And so let me get started. Uh, I, the subject of my talk today is not a new book, but it's uh, to some extent what I've uh, concluded, what I've learned from, from my research on the Stalin period. And I wanna start out before I, I do, that I'm not here to defend Stalin or to attack Stalin, or to attack Trotsky, or, or, uh, or to take a, uh, that kind of partisan view. What I'm, what I'm interested in is discovering the truth. And that is possible, and I'm going to talk about that. And I think that's what's, what we really need uh, to do. So uh, my, the subject of my talk is the crisis of Soviet history of the Stalin period, and what we should do about it. The history of the first worker state, the Soviet Union, during its heroic period, when it was led by Joseph Stalin, that history is withheld from us. It is smothered by lies from dishonest and very influential sources. How do we know this is so? What is the situation? Who are the liars? Why is this important? Finally, what should we do about it? The future of the world's working class and the fight for an egalitarian world of no rich, no poor, depends on what we do. Uh, I began to discuss this question in my March 2020 presentation to you, which was entitled Marxists Behaving Badly. Uh, that was a very partial discussion of the enormous challenge to all of us. Here I intend to confront this crisis more directly. The anti-Stalin paradigm. What I call the anti-Stalin paradigm is a special case of the anti-communist paradigm of history. In its basic formulation, the anti 
communist paradigm frames the history of the last century upside down. The Western imperialist countries are supposedly democratic, free, and stand for human rights. The former socialist bloc countries, especially the Stalin era Soviet Union, were dictatorships, totalitarian, unfree, against human rights. In reality, the opposite is and was the case. According to the anti-Stalin paradigm, Stalin was a bloodthirsty dictator who killed millions of Soviet citizens, in engineered frame-ups against many communists, and committed innumerable, quote, crimes. This, too, is all false. This paradigm, the anti-Stalin paradigm, is strictly enforced in the academic field of Soviet history. And through it, uh, in the intellectual and semi-popular media, and thence in the popular mass media, according to the anti-Stalin paradigm, it is considered illegitimate, outside the limits of respectable discussion, to disprove any crime of which Stalin has been accused. One example is an article by Professor Matthew Lino titled, quote, Did Stalin Kill Kirov and Does It Matter? This is in the Journal of Modern History, 2002. Uh, Lino insists that it, quote, doesn't matter, because even though Stalin did not kill Kirov, Stalin was so evil that the fact that he was not guilty, guilty of killing Sergei Kirov is insignificant. In his 2010 book, Kirov, The Kirov Murder and Soviet History, Lino spends a page and a half assuring his readers that although he himself has concluded that Stalin did not murder Kirov, he, Lino, loves freedom and democracy and hates dictatorship so much that no one should think for a minute that he, Lino, is pro-Stalin, something that Lino is clearly afraid of since he is violating the anti-Stalin paradigm by stating that Stalin did not commit this particular crime. Could you make it a little darker, please? Thank you. The, the glare gets in my eyes, but thanks. Ah, that's better. My own path to Soviet history. I want to explain briefly how I came to do research on the Stalin era in the Soviet Union. My story illustrates a number of important issues that I'll discuss in more detail later. The influence of anti-communism, the need for objectivity in the search for the truth, the utter bankruptcy of the profession of Soviet history, a corruption that even the best historians of this field cannot entirely escape. In 1967, while I was watching a demonstration against the Vietnam War in Manhattan, a friend of mine remarked to me that he and I should be marching with the contingent that was passing by carrying Viet Cong flags. At that moment, another onlooker told us that we should not oppose the US war in Vietnam. We asked him, why not? He replied, quote, because the NLF is led and controlled by the Vietnamese Communist Party. The Vietnamese Communist Party is led by Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh had been trained by Joseph Stalin, and Stalin had killed 20 million people." End quote. This claim stuck in my mind. I did not either believe or disbelieve it, but I resolved that someday when I had completed my doctoral dissertation in medieval comparative literature and had a job, I would look into this. A couple of years later, I bought and studied a copy of Robert Conquest's book, The Great Terror, Stalin's Purge of the 30s. I admit that I was shaken by what I read there, page after page of accusations that Stalin had committed mass murder and other terrible crimes. So I decided that this is where I would begin to look into the accusations against Stalin and by extension against the Soviet Union of his time. Uh, I made a card file of every footnote in Conquest's mammoth book. Over a period of three years, I spent my spare time taking the bus from my New Jersey apartment to the New York Public Library with its magnificent Slavic collection. There, I checked Conquest's footnotes. What I found was this. One, Conquest had no primary source evidence. He took any anti-Stalin fact claims from Khrushchev era sources and from uh, many other anti-communist sources, but none of these contained any evidence. Two, Conquest simply believed, that is, he proposed that his readers believe, that any statement made by virtually any writer, as long as it was hostile to Stalin, should be accepted as truthful. Uh, 
Not incidentally, Conquest used Leon Trotsky's autobiography, My Life, as one of his sources, and also Isaac Deutscher's flattering and dishonest biography of, of Trotsky. Three, Conquest's book has more than a thousand footnotes, but many of these were to anti-communist books that were reviewed critically, sometimes even negatively, by anti-communist reviewers at that time, and none of them contained any evidence either. Or, I came to understand that all of the professional scholars of Soviet history who reviewed Conquest's book positively were either deceiving themselves or each other or were genuinely ignorant of what primary source evidence was or both. At that time, I did not understand that the anti-Stalin paradigm existed. I was first introduced to it in 1985. I had met a young scholar you would recognize his name, who was one of the editors of Russian History, a scholarly journal still published today. At his suggestion, I drafted an article on the Tukhachevsky affair and sent it to him. The Tukhachevsky affair is the conspiracy of high-ranking Soviet military commanders against the Soviet government and in collaboration with the German high command. In that article, I reviewed all the evidence that this was a frame-up by Stalin, and concluded that there was no evidence to support that conclusion. The young reviewer made me rewrite the article several times and also had it vetted by other young scholars whom he knew. At length, he told me it was ready for publication. At this point, the publisher of Russian history, Charles Schlocks, rejected the article, but not on academic grounds, on the grounds that, quote, it made Solon look good. Of course, my article did no such thing. The real, reason he, the real reason he rejected it was that it failed to conclude that Stalin had framed Tukhachevsky and the rest. My article concluded that we just don't know. To his credit, the young scholar who had vetted my article insisted that it be published and even threatened to resign from the editorial collective if the publisher did not publish it because it had gone through the appropriate scholarly review. So my article was published, but in a strange way. The issue in which it appears contains an introduction with a commentary paragraph about each article in that issue, except for my article. The introduction simply does not mention my article at all. Fast forward to 2005. In that year, I published a two-part article in the online peer-reviewed journal, Cultural Logic, titled, Stalin and the Struggle for Democratic Reform. You may have heard of it. When it was published, a famous American Trotskyist scholar, you would recognize his name too, quit the editorial board, telling the other editors that my article should never have been published. The editors offered to publish a refutation or a criticism by him of my article, but he refused to write one and simply repeated that my article should never have been published. Outside the limits, right? Had my article been pro-Trotsky or anti-Stalin, he would certainly not have objected. Fast forward again to 2018, when I published my book on the Katyn massacre. In that book, I show from primary source evidence that the Soviet Union could not possibly have shot the Polish prisoners of war in this massacre. I also expose the dishonesty of the two major academic studies of Katyn. For some years, I had been a member of the H. Poland mailing list, one of the 100 plus academic mailing lists run by the University of Michigan and known as the HNET lists. This list had a monthly post listing new books related to Polish history. I submitted my book to be included in this list. As a result, the moderator of the list, a Polish nationalist, expelled me from the list without explanation or appeal. This was in violation of the HNET guidelines, but the HNET managers refused to reinstate me on the list. Khrushchev lied. My first book, Khrushchev Lied, was published in English in February 2011. It had been published in Russian in December 2008. Although it sold 13,000 copies in Russia, it attracted very little attention outside of Russia. But within a year, the English edition went around the world. I still did not fully comprehend the implications of the fact 
that Khrushchev had told nothing but lies about Stalin in that world-shaking secret speech of 1956. It took me some time to ask myself, why had Khrushchev told nothing but lies in that speech? Why had he not sprinkled some true crimes of Stalin in with the lies? The answer, which on reflection should have been obvious at once, is clear. Khrushchev had no true lies of Stalin. He couldn't find any. In October 1961, Khrushchev presided over the 22nd Party Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Khrushchev's acolytes attacked Stalin ferociously. Once again, those accusations, the ones I could check up on, thanks to documents from former, formerly secret Soviet archives, are all false. After the 22nd Party Congress, Khrushchev and his men did two things. First, they sponsored a flood of pseudo-historical articles and books about, quote, Stalin's crimes. <coughs> Pardon me. I have checked many of those books and articles. None of them contain any primary source evidence either. In 1962, the Khrushchev regime held a conference for party historians. That means historians of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. There, one of Khrushchev's cronies told the assembly, assembled party historians they would have to refer to the Khrushchev era textbook of party history and to the proceedings of the 22nd Party Congress. He explicitly informed them that they could not have access to documents in the Central Party archive. The realization gradually dawned upon me that the archives must not contain evidence to support the Khrushchev era allegations against Stalin. The second thing Khrushchev did was to create a blue ribbon commission under the chairmanship of Nikolai Shvernik, an old Bolshevik, to find evidence that the, that the Tukhachevsky affair defendants and the Moscow trials defendants were innocent. This commission wrote two lengthy reports, one in 1962 to 63, the other in 1964. Neither was published until 1994, after the end of the Soviet Union. In these reports, the researchers tried hard to find evidence that the military commanders and the Moscow trials defendants had been framed, that they were innocent victims of Stalin. But they were unable to do so. In fact, they found evidence to the contrary. In 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev, then the first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, launched yet another sustained attack on Stalin. Like Khrushchev's, it was accompanied by a flood of pseudo-historical articles and books, often published in hundreds of thousands of copies. Gorbachev also drew upon materials from the Khrushchev era. I have studied many of the works sponsored by Gorbachev. None of them contain primary source evidence to support charges that Stalin committed any crimes. In 1988, the Soviet Supreme Court ruled that Nikolai Bukharin and a few other defendants in the third Moscow trial of March 1938, who had not yet been rehabilitated, were innocent. The document containing the Supreme Court's ruling remains classified, that is secret, in Russia even today. But in 2007, I discovered the full text of this Soviet Supreme Court ruling in the Volkogonov archive that had been exported from Russia in the early 1990s by General Dmitry Volkogonov, a ferocious enemy of Stalin and of communism and a very close associate of Gorbachev and Yeltsin. In 2010, I published in Russian an article showing that the Soviet Supreme Court had deliberately lied in their decision. In it, they quote from a 1939 confession by Mikhail Frinovsky, Nikolai Yezhov's right-hand man in the NKVD, that confession was still secret in 1988. When it was finally published in 2006, we could see that in reality, Frinovsky testified that Bukharin was not innocent, but guilty. All this raises the question, what is evidence? Many people, including many who consider themselves to be on the left, resemble the followers of Donald Trump in that they don't care about evidence. 
What they want is material that reinforces whatever their preconceived ideas and biases already are. Persons who think this way are not interested in the truth. So what is evidence? Primary source evidence, usually though not always documents, is the only valid evidence. What then is primary source evidence? It is evidence that is as close to the matter that you are investigating as you can get. Such evidence will be biased, of course, since, like all evidence, it is created by human beings, and we all have biases. But it will only reflect the biases of its own time and place, as close to the matter under investigation as possible. I learned about primary source evidence from studying medieval literary history for my doctoral degree. I was fortunate to have an iconoclastic professor of medieval literature named Robertson, who had first shaken and then changed forever this whole academic field by insisting on studying primary source evidence, often in Latin, to explain the meaning of poets like Geoffrey Chaucer. Robertson was insulted, even shouted down at academic conventions, but he stuck to his guns and taught all of us, his graduate students, to rely on primary sources. Quote, academia is very faddish, he told us. Don't hesitate to read the evidence and make up your own mind, even if it contradicts everything the so-called experts in that field have written. That's what he did, and that's what he demanded of us. This experience was liberating for many of us graduate students. And we came to apply it to the American propaganda about the Vietnam War, too, that which we read in the New York Times and saw on television. Some of us became active in the anti-war movement and in SDS and began to study Marxism and communism. My department chairman, the famous translator Robert Fagels, once told me and another student, quote, Robertson once asked me, why are there so many Marxists in your department? I told him, Robbie, it's because of you. And he was right. Once you begin insisting on primary source evidence, it changes the way you think about everything. Primary source evidence does not have the biases of later periods. So for example, primary source evidence produced in the 1930s is close to the Moscow trials, but statements, confessions, and so on about the Moscow trials produced during Nikita Khrushchev's time, 1956 to 64, is not primary source evidence because those statements will inevitably reflect the biases of Khrushchev's time. And in fact, we know that Khrushchev was soliciting false testimony against Stalin, just as Gorbachev did later on an even larger scale. Uh, let me put this plainly with an example. For many years, for many years, the only primary source evidence we had about the Moscow trials of 1936 through 38 was the trial transcripts themselves. All the evidence in these transcripts pointed towards the guilt of the accused. Many people at that time and since have denied that the accused were guilty, but they had no evidence that the Moscow trials were frame-ups. The only primary source evidence available was that of the trial's transcripts. Therefore, since the only primary source evidence pointed unequivocally towards the guilt of the defendants, no one either at that time or since, was or is justified in drawing any other conclusion except this. On the evidence, the Moscow trials defendants were guilty. Or take the accusation that Leon Trotsky collaborated with the Nazis. We have a great deal of evidence that Trotsky collaborated with the Nazis and Japanese and others and engaged in other crimes. We have no evidence that he did not collaborate with the Nazis. We have no evidence that this evidence against Trotsky was fabricated or faked. Therefore, an objective assessment must be this, quote, in the light of the fact that all the evidence we now have points to Trotsky's guilt, objectivity demands that we conclude that Trotsky was guilty. Continuing the quote, if in future more primary source evidence is discovered that goes against this conclusion, we must be ready to revise our judgment or even to reverse it. That is, assuming we are interested in the truth. Trotsky, of course, denied his guilt. But to a serious seeker for the historical truth, Trotsky's denials are of no interest. Why? 
because we expect that both the guilty and the innocent will claim innocence. There has never been any evidence that the Moscow trials were frame-ups. On the contrary, all the primary source evidence points towards their guilt. And now from the former Soviet archives, we have an enormous amount of more evidence, more primary source evidence of the guilt of the Moscow trials defendants. So there can be no doubt of it. The Moscow trials defendants were guilty of at least those crimes to which they confessed themselves. Leon Trotsky did indeed collaborate with the Nazis among other serious crimes. Yet, a great many people believe that the Moscow trials defendants were innocent, framed by Stalin and the prosecution. They believe this in defiance of all the primary source evidence. They believe this because they do not understand what evidence is or how to use it. Also, they are accustomed to accepting the word of the academic experts in many fields. So why not accept the word of academic experts on Soviet history? But there are other barriers to discovering the truth. Objectivity. In my book, Leon Trotsky's collaboration with Germany and Japan, 2017, I wrote the following. This is a quotation. Identifying, locating, gathering, and even studying and interpreting evidence are skills that can be taught to anyone. The most difficult and unfortunately all too rare skill in historical research is the discipline of objectivity. In order to reach true conclusions, statements that are more truthful than other possible statements about a given matter, a researcher must first question and subject to doubt any preconceived ideas she may hold about the subject under investigation. It is one's own preconceived ideas and prejudices that are most likely to sway one into a subjective and incorrect interpretation of the evidence. Therefore, the researcher must take special steps to make certain this does not happen. This can be done. The techniques are known and widely practiced in the physical and social sciences. They can be adapted to historical research as well. If such techniques are not practiced, the historian will inevitably be seriously swayed from an objective understanding of the evidence by her own pre-existing pre preferences and biases. That will all but guarantee that her conclusions are false, even if she is in possession of the best evidence and all the skills necessary to analyze it. Nowhere is a devotion to objectivity more essential or less practiced than in the field of Soviet history of the Stalin period. As it is impossible to discover a truth absent a dedication to objectivity, this study, study of mine, strives to be objective. Its conclusions will displease, even outrage, a good many persons who are dedicated not to objectivity and the truth, but to protecting the legend of Trotsky as an honorable revolutionary or to defending the Cold War anti-communist paradigm of Soviet history, end quote. Media historian Michael Shudson has correctly called objectivity, quote, an ideology of the distrust of the self, end quote. In order to put it into effect, to operationalize objectivity, therefore, we must lean over backwards, as it were, make a sincere, determined, diligent attempt to minimize our own pre-existing biases and preconceived ideas. We must Look with extra skepticism at any evidence or any account that tends to support our own bias. At the same time, we must give especially generous sympathetic consideration to any evidence that tends to contradict our own bias. If we fail to do this, we will inevitably fall prey to what is called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to regard with sympathy materials that support our own bias and to regard skeptically or even to reject evidence that tends to disprove our bias. If we do this, and this is by far the normal practice in the field of Soviet history of the Stalin period, not only will we never discover the truth, being blinded by our own bias, we will not even recognize the truth if by chance we happen to run across it. 
Bias can be overt or hidden, covert. The former, overt bias, is relatively easy to recognize. Most historiography of the Stalin period, to say nothing of media accounts, reeks of overt bias. When you are confronted by overt bias, you can safely ignore what is being said or what you are reading. There is no chance that it will be a truthful account because the author has not practiced objectivity. This disqualifies all the most famous academic experts, so-called experts on Soviet history, all of them. It also disqualifies anything published by, for example, the Hoover Institution, as well as any book or article published by a fellow of the Hoover Institution, like Conquest was, or Stephen Kotkin is. Why? Because the Hoover is the largest and best funded anti-communist research institution of the world. It never ever publishes anything that could be construed as pro-communist or pro-Stalin or, or objective. Therefore, there is no chance that it will publish the truth. By the same token, you should also discount anything published by an avowed Trotskyist. A Trotskyist has, historian has no incentive to tell the truth. He or she is constrained to come to anti-Stalin conclusion and support pro-Trotsky accounts, and so is not interested in questioning his own bias, that is, in being objective. Therefore, a Trotskyist historian can never come to truthful conclusions concerning the Stalin-era Soviet Union. Historiography is not like a court trial. In historical research, there is no such thing as a presumption of innocence. There is no prosecutor and no defense attorney. There is no doctrine such as guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Why? Because no one is on trial. No one's freedom or life is at stake. And the case can be reopened at any time if new evidence comes to light. In fact, this is precisely what has happened through the publication of documents from former Soviet archives. This primary source evidence allows us to discover the truth about many events and alleged events of Soviet history of the Stalin period. Persons who do not understand this or do not understand how essential objectivity is often confuse themselves and others by claiming that, for example, Leon Trotsky must be declared innocent because there is no defense attorney or that Trotsky's guilt is not beyond a reasonable doubt. This is all wrong. The use of Soviet evidence. You sometimes hear the claim that, quote, Soviet evidence is tainted evidence, but this is false. Soviet primary sources are as useful as evidence as any other primary sources. Moreover, anti-Stalin and pro-Trotsky writers use Soviet evidence all the time. It is invalid to argument that Soviet evidence is invalid when it tends, for example, to show that Trotsky was guilty of serious crimes and conspiracies but somehow valid when it tends to show that Stalin was guilty of this or that crime. The late Vadim Z. Rogovin, the most famous Trotskyist historian of the Stalin period, used Soviet sources hundreds and hundreds of times in his numerous books. It is also invalid to argue, as many Trotskyists and anti-communists do, that, quote, Trotsky must be innocent of collaborating with the Germans because no evidence of this collaboration has turned up in the captured German archives, end quote. I hear this all the time. I have discussed this argument in detail in several of my books and at least three of my podcasts recorded here. See, for example, my book, New Evidence of Trotsky's Collaboration, uh, pages 22 to 24, for an extended discussion of this point. The bottom line is this. It is invalid to declare that Trotsky was innocent of collaboration with the Nazis because of evidence that is lacking, while ignoring the large amount of evidence of Trotsky's guilt that exists. A scientific principle states that, quote, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. We must work with the evidence we have. And in the case of Trotsky's collaboration, we have a great deal of it. Many dishonest writers rely on the fact that most of their readers do not know what evidence is or how to understand it. This is not surprising. Most people do not work with historical evidence and do not do historical research. So why would we expect that they should know what evidence is, what it is not, and how to use it? And sure enough, they don't know. But many college-educated people, and especially people with advanced degrees, assume 
that somehow they do know how to use historical evidence, even though they have never given this question any serious thought and had never been trained in using it. Such persons are especially easy to fool with fallacious arguments. This raises the question of logical fallacies. One aspect of the general ignorance about how to identify and use evidence, remember, please, primary source evidence, the only valid evidence, is the general ignorance of logical fallacies, that is, errors in informal logic. By the way, there are good Wikipedia pages on these issues, informal fallacy, list of fallacies, and informal logic. Here are some of the most common fallacies that I see all the time in persons who write me, as well as in persons who wish to criticize my work, and also in the work of anti-communist historians. Confirmation bias, I've already discussed that. Ad hominem argument, for example, name calling. Appeals to authority. Begging the question, that is, assuming that which needs to be proven. Argument from incredulity. For example, quote, I can't believe that, therefore it isn't true, or therefore it is less likely to be true. Argument from repetition. You hear a fact claimed so often from so many different sources that you feel there must be at least some truth to it, right? Where there's smoke, there's fire. Association fallacy. Quote, Grover Fur is a Stalinist. This is also an example of an ad hominem argument, right? Name calling. Grover Fur is a Stalinist, so there's no need to read his research because Stalinists are wrong. Guilt by association is another version of this. Argument from motive. Quote, Fur wants to find Stalin blameless of any crime, therefore you can dismiss whatever he writes. Bandwagon, the bandwagon effect. All the experts say it, that's an appeal to authority, so we can be pretty sure it's true. Red herring, an example of red herring. In the first Moscow trial, defendant Goltzman claimed that in November 1932, he met Trotsky's son Leon Sedov in a Copenhagen hotel and then went to visit Trotsky. The red herring here is the evidence that he could not have met Sedov since Sedov wasn't there. But that doesn't mean he didn't meet with Trotsky. Trotsky used that red herring to great effect. Shifting the burden of truth. It's up to Fur or whoever to explain why there's no evidence of Trotsky's conspiracy with the Germans and Japanese and the German and Japanese archives instead of dealing with the mounds of Soviet evidence that Trotsky did collaborate. Argument from consequences. If Fur is correct that Trotsky collaborated with the Germans and Japanese, then the whole Trotskyist movement for the past 90 years is a delusion, and that would be so awful that it just can't be true. Why do most people think that Stalin was a criminal? The short answer is for the same reason that most people think communism is bad and the communist movement was bad. That is, anti-communist, anti-Stalin propaganda. After the Russian Revolution, the field of Soviet studies was established mainly to provide ammunition in the form of academic sounding falsehoods to political anti-communism. It was never primarily about discovering the truth about the Soviet Union. Leon Trotsky's lies about Stalin, and they are lies as I have shown in several of my books, had a limited though important circulation on the non-communist and anti-communist left. The Cold War caused an increase in anti-communist propaganda. But Nikita Khrushchev's infamous secret speech to the 20th Party Congress in February 1956 was a body blow to the world communist movement from which it never recovered. In it, Khrushchev described Stalin as a criminal, much as Trotsky had done. In fact, Khrushchev seems to have taken some of his lies from Trotsky's writings, though of course, without attributing them to Trotsky. Under Khrushchev, the 22nd Party Congress in October 1961 witnessed an orgy of anti-Stalin lies and accusations. Afterwards, Khrushchev sponsored a flood of articles and books accusing Stalin of all matter of heinous crimes. None of these works contained any evidence. For remember, only primary sources are valid evidence. After 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev launched an attack on Stalin and the Stalin era even larger and more vicious than that of Khrushchev, some of whose lies Gorbachev recycled. In the post-Soviet period, scholars of the Soviet, of Soviet history continued to repeat the lies of the Khrushchev and Gorbachev periods. 
none of which are supported by primary source evidence, and to invent even more crimes, equally without evidence to support those accusations. The big lie. The foregoing is the background for what is called, after Adolf Hitler, the big lie. Here are two quotations from Hitler's autobiography, My Struggle, also known as Mein Kampf. Quote, the aim of propaganda is not to, not to try to pass judgment on conflicting rights, giving each its due, but exclusively to emphasize the right which we are asserting. Propaganda must not investigate the truth objectively, and insofar as it is favorable to the other side, present it according to the theoretical rules of justice. It must present only that aspect of the truth which is favorable to its own side. All this was inspired by the principle, which is quite true in itself, this is still Hitler, that in the big lie there is always a certain for force of credibility. This is because they themselves, the broad masses, often tell small lies in little matters. But we'd be ashamed to resort to large-scale falsehoods. It would never come into their heads to fabricate colossal untruths. Therefore, they would not believe that others could have the impudence to distort the truth so infamously. For the grossly impudent lie always leaves traces behind us, behind it, even after it has been refuted a fact which is known to all expert liars in, the, in this world and to all who conspire together in the art of lying. Hitler was writing about the broad masses and about mass propaganda. But the same principle works with more educated people as long as the big lies are wrapped in academic packaging. Many, if not most educated people are simply unwilling to believe that so many professional, famous, respected academic historians could possibly be promoting falsehoods, claims of crimes by Stalin or the Soviet Union or the Stalin period, which cannot be supported by evidence. Such people are much more likely to think that the person, myself, for example, who tells them this is himself lying. That is comforting because in this case, he, fur, can be ignored. Whereas if the former were taken seriously, the consequences for our whole way of understanding Soviet history during Stalin's time, and in fact, our whole way of understanding world history of the time, would be shaken or even dismantled. This is the fallacy called argument from consequences. The consequences of learning and accepting that Soviet history has been so completely falsified appear to be so serious, so devastating, that it is far easier to dismiss anyone who shows this to be true. That then is the big lie and how it works, and it works very well. Hitler was commenting on the effectiveness of allied propaganda in World War I, which he recognized had used the big lie technique well, while Germany had not. Western journalists too commented on the extent of lying by the Allied mass media during the war. The importance of these facts. The question of Stalin is the most important question facing workers, students, and intellectuals worldwide who are striving to get rid of capitalism or even those who are striving to reform it. The big lie is that Joseph Stalin was a mass murderer who framed on false charges and killed a great many loyal communists and millions of Soviet citizens. This big lie is not only taken for granted as true, it is virtually taboo to question it, first in the academic field of Soviet history itself, and then in the semi-popular, popular, and mass media. The experts all claim that Stalin was a mass murderer. The media cannot and do not do independent research on their own. They're not equipped to do it. So they repeat what the experts say. The Trotskyist cult around the world echoes these lies. In this way, they are smuggled directly into left movements, socialist and communist worldwide. This is the anti-Stalin paradigm. Anti-Stalinism is the main form that anti-communism takes in the world today. Anti-Stalinism is employed to discredit anyone who struggles for a better world. As an example of this, 
I can cite a debate that I participated in in October 2012 against a conservative and a libertarian. I was invited by a student group to do this. The libertarian was a Soviet emigre who had left the Soviet Union in the late 1980s and who teaches at Hillsdale College, a right-wing college in the Midwest. In my presentation, I told the student audience that they should have free higher education. The libertarian replied that any involvement of the government in your lives puts you on the slippery slope to communism and quote, Stalin killed 40 million people. Okay, this is the kind of stuff that we are all facing. Republicans call AOC, who is a mild social democrat, a quote, little communist. The Koch network, network and other right-wing foundations want to get rid of public education and the minimum wage. The Peterson Foundation wants to get rid of social security. Forget about social reforms of any kind. These creeps want to make us completely dependent on private employers. What a bonanza for the capitalists. It is important that we, you, face the facts. All of us are under attack by the lies against Stalin. What should we or must we do about this? It's up to us to do whatever we can to counter and then to roll back this avalanche of lies about Stalin and the Soviet Union during his time. Excuse me. Here is one outline of a program of action that every one of us here can participate in. One, study. We must educate ourselves. Study to understand what primary source evidence is. Study in order to recognize logical fallacies. Study what we know about the Stalin period now. My books are a good place to, to do this. This is why I'm speaking to you to, here today. Two, spread the word. Social media, mailing lists, Think of port side and other lists like it. Talk to your political comrades and colleagues. Participate in study groups, debates, discussions. Three, challenge anti-Stalin, anti-communist lies wherever you encounter them. Write a letter to the editor every time you see a lie about Stalin or the Stalin era Soviet Union in some article. Write for publications like ML Today, Counterpunch, Jacobin, book reviews, for example. Remember, Remember this, the world's greatest expert on Stalin and the Soviet Union during his time, Stephen Kotkin of Princeton University and the Hoover Institution, wrote a book in which every single allegation of crime or even minor misdeed by Stalin is provably, demonstrably false. I demonstrate this in detail in my book, Stalin Waiting for the Truth. If Kotkin could not find even a single real provable crime of Stalin, it has to be because like Khrushchev, he couldn't find evidence of even one of them. So in order not to violate the anti-Stalin paradigm, he had to falsify and lie. Four, never be afraid to say, quote, I don't know. Nobody can know everything. And it's important to be honest, first of all, with yourself, and secondly, with others, with each other. In the early 1970s, an example, in the early 1970s, a friend of mine who was in the Progressive Labor Party showed me a PLP internal bulletin. This was a venue where party members could write their views, questions, doubts, and so on. One PLer had written that he or she read in so many places about the crimes of Stalin, couldn't some of them be true? What to do? Another PLer responded like this. One, never believe any pro-capitalist, anti-communist so-called authority. Because why wouldn't they lie about Stalin and the communist movement, who are their deadly enemies? Two, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. That is correct. Whenever you hear some allegation of a crime of Stalin, you should say, I don't know. But there's no reason to believe anti-communists or Trotskyists because they have no incentive to tell the truth and every reason to ignore the truth and to lie. And you should recommend my research and study it yourself. The most important reason. Yes, it's vitally important to establish the truth about Stalin and the first worker state, the Soviet Union, in order to refute the anti-communist lie that, quote, communism leads to massive crimes and mass murder. But there's another reason. We need to understand why the Soviet Union did not build socialism and then 
develop in a more and more egalitarian democratic manner towards communism. This was certainly the goal of Lenin and Stalin and of millions of working people in the Soviet Union and of hundreds of millions of working people around the world who looked at the Soviet Union with hope. Now we have from the former Soviet archives, the text of the draft of the proposal, proposed party program of 1947, which calls for much more democratic control by the population and much less reliance on compulsion of any kind. This fascinating document has only been available for a few years and has not been discussed in the field of Soviet studies. I hope to talk about it at a future time. We can never learn the lessons that the history of this, the first worker's state has to teach us if we are blinded by lies. The only way we can learn what the Soviet Union under Lenin and Stalin did that was right, correct, and what they did that turned out to be wrong, incorrect, leading not towards communism, but back towards capitalism. The only way we can hope to learn these lessons is if we were in possession of the truth about Soviet history. We can never learn these vital lessons from lies. The capitalists, of course, have already drawn their lessons from their, their false history of the so Stalin era Soviet Union. The lesson they want us to believe is that the overthrow of capitalism through communist revolution will lead to dictatorship, mass murder, and a worse world even than the capitalist world. This is all false. For first, so first, we must prove to ourselves and to each other that it is false. Then we must convince others that it is false. But we can't stop there. We have to go on to study what it is that the Bolsheviks did that we should imitate and what it is that led them off the road to communism and that, and that the communist movements of the future must learn from and avoid. Therefore, it is vital that we study the Soviet experience. If we fail to do this, at best we run the danger of making the same error, errors that the Soviets did and ending up back at capitalism uh, as in Russia today. In his book, The 18th of Brumaire, The 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, Karl Marx wrote, quote, Hegel remarks somewhere that all great world historical facts and personages appear, so to speak, twice. He forgot to add the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce, end quote. The tragedy of the international communist movement of the 20th century was that ultimately it failed. Unless we figure out where they went wrong, and we are doomed to be the farce, and that would be a crime, our crime. So we have to look with a critical eye at all of our legacy. Marx's favorite saying was, de omnibus dubitandum, question everything. Marx would be the last person in the world to exclude himself from this questioning. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Grover. And uh, so now we'll be going into question and comment period. But before that, there are some announcements. So Gene, are you ready with the announcement, please? <laughs> you better Hong Kong believe I'm ready, yes. So uh, coming up uh, next week is August 1st. Um, we are very fortunate in locating uh, Jerry Condon, who is um, a f former uh, national chair of uh, Veterans for Peace. Uh, and a long time observer and participant in the struggle for to know Nic the Nicaraguan struggle better. He will speak on the topic of revolutionary Nicaragua in the crosshairs of imperialism. And so he knows this very well. Uh, I'll let you read the description of it uh, on our web page. So that is something I'm looking forward to and I know everyone else should be also. Uh, Following that, on August 8th, uh, Elazar Freeman um, will discuss the imperative need to develop a Leninist united front to combat the menace of fascism and white supremacist, white supremacist attacks in today's United States. And he will discuss that and a number of aspects of that. And you can also read about that on our webpage at icssmarks.org. And um, then after that, we have um, actually starting August 15th, we have nothing else scheduled, but we will come up with some uh, good topics. 
Um, and uh, so anyway, I'll turn it back to you, Raj. Uh, Richard Fallenbaum is not here. So I think in the break, we can make the fund appeal. Gene, could you do that when we get to there or would somebody else? Well, I can very briefly uh, urge people to either read, it's on our webpage, so read that. And also it's on the email that we send out every time. So uh, I could read that, but I think it'd be more productive if people read it, took whatever notes they need from our webpage or the reminder that we send out. Okay, so we're gonna go now to question and comment period. And I see four hands raised. Judy Van was the first one to raise, but if I'm a little bit out of sequence, please forgive me because I didn't, I wasn't monitoring it. People raised hands. Let's minimize this picture. Uh, you can do that. Oh yeah, I can go to that other view, which is uh, gallery view. You would prefer this? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, Judy Ann would be first, followed by Marilyn, then Yusuf, and then Trajan uh, Kanaru, uh, if I pronounce that right. So this will be the sequence. So Judy Ann, and then followed by uh, Eugene Wu. So these are the first people to raise hands, unless I'm making a mistake. So go ahead, Judy Ann. You want to take, take notes about it? She comes first. Well, I don't know if I have this set up right. Just a second. Um, and actually, I wasn't. I wasn't going to comment, Grover, on what you were saying. I, I always really enjoy hearing you because you always make me think about what it is that I'm reading. And I remember when we were little, my parents had us read the New York Times between the lines. Was how they called it because, and as we got older, if we went to demonstrations and we saw what was going on at the demonstration and then we read about it in the New York Times, it was like, almost like two different things. Sure. Being there and hearing and seeing was different from reading it about it in the New York Times. And that was the first time I, as I got older, I began to realize what my parents were talking about, why you read between the lines. Uh, the only reason I put my hand up originally, uh, Yusuf, was to tell you when you let people in that I invited 25 people from Nevada to, to sit in and listen to this discussion. Um, and I didn't know whether or not they would. And I was hoping that if their names are names you're not used to seeing, you would still have them come in. That's why I had done that. Okay. So thank you, Grover, very much. Thank you. So no response from you, Grover, on this? Or shall no, we go to good. the next one? Yeah, OK, next one. Marilyn, you're next. OK, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Grover, for your presentation. Always a pleasure yeah. to hear from you. Yeah. And I'm glad you could be here in person. Uh, hopefully, right. next time you're in town, we can all be in the same room together. Right. Anyway, I wanted to ask you about the accusations against Stalin about the famines that mm -hmm. occurred during uh, the Stalin period. Um, certainly mm -hmm. famines in the 30s, I think, were blamed on him. Can you address that? And also, to the extent possible, the role of Lysenko. I don't know if you personally have researched the truth mm -hmm. about Lysenko. He's also been terribly demonized by the academic scientific establishment. Sure. If you don't have that information, if you know of any resources sure. that do shed light on that, please. Sure, sure, sure. Well, let me start with the famines. Um, uh, at the time of the famine itself, this is 1932-33, uh, the uh, Ukrainian nationalists who were largely in Germany, to some extent they were in Poland, uh, outside of Ukraine, uh, blamed the famine on, uh, on Stalin and the Soviet Union, blamed it on collectivization. And um, uh, this was, I suppose, not widely believed, but it was, it was, um, it was in circ these ideas were in circulation. Um, the notion that uh, the famine was deliberately caused by the Soviets in order to decimate the Ukrainian population 
originated uh, with Ukrainian nationalists who had collaborated with the Nazis and, and they wanted to equate this with the Holocaust of the Jews. And they did equate it with the Holocaust of the Jews. Uh, these people who were in immigration in the United States and Germany and Canada uh, went surging back to Ukraine once Ukraine was uh, independent after 1990 or so and uh, got control of the uh, historical uh, profession and, and to a large extent uh, the educational system. And so that is now one of the foundation stones of modern right-wing crypto-fascist Ukrainian nationalism. Uh, it's been disproven uh, and the, the best research on this topic uh, is by a professor named Mark Tauger at West Virginia University. Uh, in, uh, I devote two chapters of my book, Bl Blood Lies, to, uh, to this issue, and one chapter in my book, Stalin Waiting for the Truth, about Kotkin, uh, and uh, show not only that it's not true, but it, that, that it's, uh, this argument is deployed you know, very dishonestly. But the Ukrainian nationalists um, aren't going to give up on it. They have constructed um, monuments or memorials uh, to the victims of this deliberate, so-called deliberate famine. In Washington, D.C., there's a large one. Uh, there are some elsewhere in the world and, of course, throughout Ukraine. And it's, you're simply not permitted to question it uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. In, in, in Ukraine and in right-wing discourse in general. Ann Applebaum, who is a journalist for the Washington Post, has a book called Red Famine, where she pushes this art argument. This is an interesting anti-Stalin uh, falsification in that no uh, Western scholar uh, outside the Ukraine, uh, even the most anti-communist of them, even the most conservative of them, uh, embraces or uh, assents to the notion of a deliberate famine, not even the most conservative ones. Well, Anne Applebaum's not really a scholar. She's a journalist. Uh, so it, the Ukrainian nationalists clearly would like the Holodomor to be accepted in the way in which the Katyn massacre is accepted. You know, the Soviets supposedly killed all the Polish, uh, a lot of Polish uh, officers. Uh, and they would like to have, to have as, as wide acceptance of the story of the deliberate famine, impo, you know, of Stalin's deliberate famine, accepted as widely as, as that of the Katyn massacre. But it isn't. So if you want to read a, a sort of survey of the evidence uh, against this lie, you could read either the chap first two, uh, the chapters two and three of Blood Lies, or uh, there's a chapter in my book, Stalin Waiting for the Truth. Lysenko. Well, it so happens that, of course, Lysenko has to do with, with um, uh, agriculture. You know, he, he was developing new forms of new seed, new forms of new strains of wheat to, um, uh, that, would, that would bring, that would, that would ripen quicker and bring uh, and be more resistant to um, drought, flood, uh, insects, rust, uh, plant diseases, and so forth. Uh, so that more foodstuffs could be grown in the much shorter growing period that, uh, that Russia has. Uh, Mark Tauger, the same Mark Tauger who has investigated the, um, the uh, famines, uh, has also done some work on Lysenko. Uh, and, uh, you know, I could refer you to him. Um, I think the real question is not so much whether Lysenko was right or wrong. I think that Pretty much everybody now agrees that he was wrong, although, I'll, although not everybody. Uh, I don't have any independent opinion about that. I'm not a, not a geneticist. Um, the error, I believe, that the Soviet Party, including Stalin, made was to uh, adopt a party position uh, in 1948 in defense of, of Lysenko. Uh, and uh, Yuri Zhdanov, who later, who was the son of Andrei Zhdanov, one of Stalin's right-hand men, who, uh, and who later married, was married for a short time to um, uh, Stalin's daughter, uh, Yuri Zhdanov was picked as a young man to set forth the party's position, and he didn't do it very well. And Stalin said, well, you should have done it better than that. But in a few years, according to Zhdanov, Stalin changed his mind and said, uh, we, should, we should allow 
greater variety of opinion about um, uh, about Lysenko's ideas, the idea that that um, uh, properties can uh, uh, this uh, properties can be genetically uh, inherited. Properties that are acqu acquired properties, properties acquired through being uh, uh, subjected to certain external conditions can be then be genetically inherited. And I just want to mention, I'm not qualified to get into this, um, uh, the late Richard Lewontin, who recently died, who was a very famous left-wing uh, Marxist um, geneticist at Harvard, um, came out some years ago, and, and he's not the only one, uh, in, in, in qualified um, defense of the uh, position that uh, Lysenko is identified with, that is, the, in, the uh, inheritance of acquired characteristics. And Liam Wanton believes that there is much truth in this, that it turns out not to be a wacky idea. But, but uh, although I don't want to comment on this because I'm not a geneticist and I'm not qualified to go, to go into that, I think that Lysenko went, went far beyond that. And he uh, rejected Mendelian genetics um, uh, on a, on a more broadly. And then one final point, interesting point, is that when when this debate was going on in the 1930s and 40s, genetics in the West, with some exceptions, of course, genetics in the West were a lot, was largely, uh, had, been, had been to a large extent captured by racists who were uh, falsely deploying genetic ideas in the form of eugenics to uh, perpetuate uh, racist ideas. And so one of the attractive features at that time of what seemed to be the attractive features of Lysenko's arguments was that, that this is an anti-racist uh, kind of science. But I don't, but, but nevertheless, I, a, um, I don't want to comment you know, on whether Lysenko was correct or not, was correct or not. I don't want to get into the genetics of it. And B, uh, Mark Tauger, whom I've been in touch with for many years now, who studied Lysenko very carefully because he's an expert in Soviet agriculture, uh, refers to Lysenko as crazy Lysenko. In other words, that he just thinks that there are some, some serious irrationalities in Lysenko's work. However, one more thing, since you asked. Uh, it is often written that uh, Lysenko uh, played a role in the arrest, imprisonment, interrogation, and ultimately in the death from disease of uh, Nikolai Vavilov, who was a geneticist in the Soviet Union at that time and, and whose reputation has, uh, is, is uh, significant even today. That turns out to be false if you look at the evidence. I did look that up. That's a historical question, not a genetics question. That's not true. Uh, Lysenko had nothing to do with his arrest and uh, the persecution of, of uh, Vavilov, who, who, by the way, I think the evidence shows that Babylon really was involved in some sort of conspiracy or other against the Soviets. Uh, and it is also often said, for example, by Lauren Graham, who is a, now retired, but a well-known uh, historian of science who's written about Soviet science. It's often said that uh, the geneticists in the Soviet Union were suppressed uh, and even persecuted as a result of Lysenko's predominance during that period. And that too is false. In fact, an anti-Lysenko geneticist won the Stalin Prize uh, in the late 40s or early 50s. I have it in one of my books. Uh, so he just fabricated that. But you often hear it in the popular and semi-popular press that this is the case. There's a book out there called The Murder of Nikolai Vavilov. And, and, and it's all about this issue of Vavilov versus Lysenko. And the fact of the matter is that it's, a, it's, it's false. Lys Vavilov was not murdered. But that's, that's the kind of lie that, you know, that sounds good and sells books. And so there you go. Um, that's about all I know. Okay. Just real quick follow-up. Okay. Is there any evidence that 
uh, millions of, or thousands or millions of Soviet citizens died due to famines caused by following Lysenko's uh, principles? None. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go tell you what the sequence is of the next people. Yusuf is next, and then Trajan is, follows Yusuf, then Eugene follows Trajan, and then Veda Brata follows uh, Eugene, and Kumar Gupta follows Veda Brata. So please go ahead in that sequence, Yusuf. Uh, okay, oh, thank sorry, you. I'm sorry, uh, sorry, I left Elazar out. Elazar is actually ahead of Veda uh, Brata. I will remove it. Uh, Bedabrat and Kumar. So Elazar is before them. So Elazar actually follows uh, Eugene. Okay, so go ahead, Yusuf. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, okay, I, one thing I, I, well, I think when he, cases where Latanka could be right, I think applies to bacteria that have extra uh, bits of genetic material. When I don't, uh, the, uh, but, we, but my point is, thank you very much for uh, uh, a, a presenting a, a, the methodology of historians. I'd also like to add that the historian seeks the most probable uh, a scenario given uh, the evidence. And if the evidence then changes to uh, another scenario, one moves uh uh, to that, because there's always a finite probability that somehow the whole world uh, conspired to uh, fabricate uh, this or that uh, evidence. But uh, uh, usually that such things are uh, uh, so improbable that uh, historians disregard that. I think when uh, I've done some uh, historical research of my own that uh, uh, so uh, I, th I, I, I would like to add uh, uh, that uh, uh, aspect of uh, uh, probability. And if you have any response to that, I'd um, uh, welcome it. Well, I said that in my talk. Basically, I said what you said using some of different words. So I agree with you. OK, after this is Frajan. Uh, uh, can, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, Trayon. It's uh, Trayon. Okay, sorry. Close I, enough. Okay, okay. Uh, sorry about that. I appreciate the evidence that go over uh, in this program. I just want to mention I have some evidence of myself, uh, family evidence. Uh, <clears throat> my mother was taken as slave labor from the Nazis during World War II. But, anyways, she was from a little village. Mm -hmm near Kremenchuk in Ukraine in, mm -hmm. in the 1930s. And she told me about the famine. She never referred to it as genocide. It was a drought. Yeah. She told me, I can remember when I was a kid, that the ground was so dry that cracks formed between, in the soil and you had to step across it. it. You couldn't plant anything. This is always left out in the media when they talk about the Ukrainian famine. I read the Ukrainian week, that's, it's a Ukrainian nationalist organization here in the United States. They're all right wingers. Yep. And every issue they talk, every issue, I'm not kidding. They talk about the famine. It's become the Holocaust for the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. and, but they never mention the drought, the extreme drought. You can't grow food when a drought hits. Just like if the West now in the U.S., if you're going to go plant cornfields, it's not going to grow because you're not getting any rain. And that's basically what happened during that time. Yep. And that also I want to point out that a lot of these uh, Ukrainian nationalists are from Rus Western Ukraine mm -hmm. that came here mm -hmm. after World War II and a lot of them supported the Nazis. Yep. And uh, you think about Western Ukraine, that was occupied by Poland after the Brest, Brest Agreement, after the Soviet Russia lost the war to Poland. Mm -hmm. And many of these uh, Ukrainians never experienced the famine. Mm -hmm. They're for, they lived in Poland. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not telling the truth. They act like they're the ones who went through it. But here I have my own mother. You know, she never politicized. She just said it was a drought. It was not genocide. Mm -hmm. And then, and like what your book was saying, you know, the, the, there were areas of Russia, and I think Kazakhstan, that had uh, the famine mm -hmm. that hit. 
because of the drought. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is how they lie. And, and they use this as a uh, anti-communist uh, <clears throat> thing to say this, this is what Stalin did. Yep. Stalin didn't have anything. It's just like if you want to plant something now out west, it's not going to grow. So that's my comment. Great. Oh, that's true. And you should, uh, uh, Mark Tiger's research is very good on this. And um, I summarize that in two chapters in my book, Blood Lies, and one chapter in my, in my book, uh, Stalin Waiting for the Truth. But of course, I have the references to Tauger's original works there. If you care, to get, that would be a good place to go and find them. And you could study it for yourself. Sure, I agree with you. Okay, next is Elazar followed by Vedabrata, followed by Kumar, and then, John, and then Rich, sorry, Jean. Did you skip me? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Jean. Uh, okay. Uh, you will, why don't let Elazar go and then you follow Elazar, then Vedabrata. I thought I was before him, but that's okay. Uh, is it okay if Elazar goes? Because I think it's Elazar, okay. If you, it's Elazar. okay if she goes before me. Whatever is the proper order is what I want. Okay, so Jean, go ahead. Okay, well, well thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Grover. I always enjoy your talks uh, and find them enlightening and worthwhile. Um, and, and like yourself, I, I've uh, been in academia all my life, uh, teaching anthropology and Marxism, and always included uh, a section on methodology. And I used to use this or re- give reference to this little book, How to Lie with Statistics. Yep. And in there, there's this little quote, uh, which uh, I found very good that they say, there's liars, there's damn liars, and then there's statisticians. Mm -hmm. And I'll give this to you, Grover, you can use it perhaps uh, as with reference to the Hoover Institution, Mm -hmm. where as we know, there are liars, there's damn liars, and then there's the Hoover Institution, Mm -hmm. and then there's uh, the CIA, and then there's uh, the State Department, the entire apparatus. Uh, and what I would like to add there is this is not only active with the Soviet Union, it's anti-communist to the core, and it's also being applied towards China. So you have all this nonsense being written based on reports from the CIA about Xinjiang and the oppressed Uyghurs, about Tibet, about Hong Kong, Taiwan, and so forth. So I think it's uh, the, I, lo- I like the work you're doing and keep it up. And I think we need to apply these principles more generally. But thank you again, it's an excellent talk. Thank you for your comment. Elazar. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for your presentation, Grover. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't agree with all your conclusions, but there are a large part that I do agree with. And here's my problem. I believe that you conflate anti-communist imperialist lies about the Soviet Union, like the Holodomor, which uh, I'm more influenced by the round table that J.R. Getty participated in, disproving that the Soviets in any way wanted to cause a famine and use it in a genocidal way. He also refutes uh, Stalin's role, uh, a causative role in a Kirov assassination, on and on and on. I used a non-totalitarian school. Actually, I learned about it from you. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, uh, and I'm sure they make errors as you do. So here's my problem. You conflate revolutionary Trotskyism, that is, I inherited from the, the womb of the Spartacist League, which all the other Trotskyist milieu organizations called Stalinists, mm-hmm. because they defended the Soviet worker state until the last gasp. And that meant at the risk of arrest or even death. Mm-hmm. Some of them, maybe I don't agree with it, were volunteered to join the PDPA government and the Soviet Union fighting against the uh, cutthroats that the CIA hired to attack Afghanistan. That was a key question. We supported, we call hail the Red Army in Afghanistan. And the Spartacist League offered to send a contingent wisely, perhaps that was turned down. I think it has been romantic. Okay, so that's my problem with you is in terms of Trotsky's guilt, primary source evidence is not just the files 
of the NKVD or a Soviet hierarchy. It's also people that were freed from the gulags. It's also testimony of survivors. It's also contrary evidence, which I find very often you're forced to leave out. I don't want to get into all it right now, but let me just deal quickly with the Lysenko thing and your demeaning of the book by Peter Pringle, okay? You do not know scientific genetics whatsoever. You do not even understand the role of Nikolai Vavilov, whereas the head, one of the founders of the French Communist Party, uh, who wrote the book Biology and Marxism, Marcel Prinon, who taught it, who taught at uh, Sorbonne, was a leader in the uh, the resistance, the anti-Nazi resistance. He supported Lysenko's philosophic critique of mechanistic genetics, which is what was being taught in the United States and everywhere else. And in a sense, present and, and uh, Lysenko made some very interesting philosophic critiques. The problem is the falsity of their scientific practice. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem that I'm not sure you grasp. Also, it's true that Lysenko signed a petition for Vavilov, but he also helped set him up. He actually said in session that a scientist too can be the class enemy and can be counter-revolutionary. And I do not buy, and the evidence that you once sent in an article does not prove Vavilov guilty, and neither did Marcel Prenon, who was forced out of the French Communist Party that he helped found, a true fighter against the Nazis and a true biologist because he would not demean Vavilov. And I think you accept every little file as absolute objective primary evidence, and you leave out the full context. That's my problem with you. Thank you very much. It's not a personal problem, and I'll get into the political problem in my talk of the United Front. Sure. Okay, uh, let me just respond briefly. You're right. I don't know anything about genetics. You're absolutely right. I think I said that, but let me say it again. Um, I'm not here to argue for or against Lysenko or Vavilov. Okay. Uh, the question does arise um, whether Lysenko, um, as it were, um, was responsible in some way or other for Vavilov's arrest, and the answer is no, he wasn't, and not on the evidence we have. The as another question arises is, was Vavilov guilty? And whether you believe it or not is really, whether anybody believes it or not is really irrelevant. The fact of the matter is that, it, that a good number of primary sources have been and according to those primary sources, Vavilov was guilty. But that doesn't mean, of course, that he's definitely guilty. There may be more primary source evidence out there or available somewhere or other that, that, that proves his innocence. And if there is, I'd be glad to see it. I'm, uh, and I'd like to know the truth. Uh, it is fashionable to say that Vavilov was framed wrongly by either Stalin or Lysenko or some combination, but the evidence does not support that. Uh, but as for whether or not Vavilov, you know, exactly where Vavilov went wrong, because I think no one claims that he, no one claims that he didn't go wrong, exactly where he went wrong, uh, I am not qualified to say. I'm not a geneticist, and I really, at this point, don't care. I'm interested in the political issues, not in the scientific issues, because those are the ones I can deal with. Um, Over, could you it. get a little closer to the sure. microphone? Yep, I can. Thank you. Here I am. Okay, so the next person is Beda Brother, Fine, followed by Kumar, and then Norma, and then Rich Johnson. Please go ahead, Beda. Uh, hi, th thank you, Raj. Um, Grover, it's great to see you again. Nice to see uh, you. Yeah, <laughs> I have uh, one short comment since this Lysenko thing is coming up again and again, and then a question for you. The short comment is that and I don't want to get into the, into the history or politics of it, but just for all of us to know that this so-called Lamarckism mm -hmm. has made a comeback in biology, and that that this is a this is something that is very very well being researched at many many different levels, and that should not be forgotten. So mm -hmm. things are not that genetics is is the final truth is absolutely been shown to be false, mm -hmm. but I want to that's not the topic of our discussion today. So maybe that can be sure. something to discuss another time. My question to you is, uh, well, first of all, the, the, your methodology is something that everybody should adopt, even though you know, 
people can debate what constitutes primary evidence, what's left out, what's not left out. But the, the manner in which you approach history is something that is, uh, is extremely commendable. But uh, my question was on the question which you briefly touched upon was the struggle for democratic reform. I think that's, that's, that's one of the most key issues mm -hmm. of Soviet Union that's not talked about. Mm -hmm. And how Stalin and various other uh, leaders mm -hmm. tried to democratize Soviet Union. By that, what I mean is that the, the governance and the rule to be carried out by working people at large, not by the party or not by party mm -hmm. uh, apparatus, mm -hmm. but by people at large. And, and mm -hmm. the, the, the various, um, uh, various mechanisms that, that Stalin and others were trying to put in place you mentioned very briefly, but if you can address that a little bit, I think that it, that that would be great. Or maybe another time you won't pick it up another time. Okay, uh, I recommend my uh, 2005 two-part article in Cultural Logic, which is linked on my homepage, called "Stalin and the Struggle for Democratic Reform," uh, which was based mainly on research done by uh, Russian historians up to that point, uh, and some of it done by me, uh, and then. Uh, I mentioned that the 1947, a 1947 party program about how to go from wherever they were in 1947 to communism uh, has been published, uh, and uh, but entirely without context. That is to say, the stuff that comes out that's come out of the Soviet archives, post-war materials that have come out of the Soviet archives, is is, is um, uh, is very fragmentary. In, the, in Russia today, there's a, um, uh, a law that says that material should be declassified after 75 years. Well, 1947 was 74 years, something like that. So um, for the most part, the materials, uh, uh, archival materials, for the most part, about uh, post-war Soviet history during the Stalin period uh, has not been declassified. Uh, one hopes that in the next decade or so, uh, there'll be a lot of it, although I'm, you know, we never know. But, um, but really don't have any context for this um, party program of 1947. Nevertheless, uh, I have it in mind that uh, it should be published in translation with some sort of commentary it certainly shows that, uh, at least as far as the Politburo is concerned, Stalin and the, and the top leadership uh, in Moscow, uh, there was a sincere, uh, dedicated attempt to move to the next stage of, of uh, communism. By the way, that was also the theme of the 19th Party Congress in October 1952. That is the only Party Congress the... Um, whose transcript, the transcript of whose proceedings has never been published. The only one in the whole history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. That transcript has never been published. Uh, but large parts of it were published in Pravda, and I've had those, I have that material. So uh, something very important was happening uh, at the, uh, towards, the, towards the end of Stalin's life. There was certainly some sort of attempt to move towards uh, communism. Uh, it seems to have been uh, uh, derailed, uh, set aside, turned away from almost immediately after Stalin died. Uh, and that's a story that still needs to be told, in, in part because very few people are interested in telling it. I am interested, but also in part because we just don't, it seems that we don't have the primary source evidence. But I think there's no question that that uh, two-part article of mine from 2005, Stalin, the struggle for democratic reform could be uh, continued and, and sort of uh, uh, projected uh, up to the, the time of, of Stalin's death. That was certainly what he and others associated with him wanted to do. The question, the big question is then is, is why, why didn't it happen? Okay, so next <laughs> is Kumar and uh, it will be followed by Norma Rick Johnson, and then Austin. So Kumar, please proceed. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, I just want to first make a comment that I agree with Vedor Broto regarding uh, his comments on genetics, but 
that's a discussion for another day. Uh, today, my question for you is that what is your opinion about the writings of Alexander Solzhenitsyn regarding Gulag? And would you consider his experience as he describes as a primary source evidence? Thank sure. you. Sure. Uh, well, I talked briefly, briefly, very briefly about the whole Gulag issue in my talk of March 2020. Which I guess it must be must be on YouTube somewhere, um, but uh, it's one of those you know it can only do so much, and I haven't written a book about the Gulag, but um, uh, Solzhenitsyn's work is cited by nobody today. Uh, Solzhenitsyn did not, of course, have access to primary source evidence, uh, and uh, and uh, so he reported uh, rumors and. And hearsay and so forth and so on. It was uh, it served as great um, propaganda, uh, particularly in the West, uh, but uh, is not taken seriously by historians today, even the anti-communist historians, because we have so much primary source evidence about the penal system in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, which was not, by the way, all. Uh, it was not all labor camps. The Gulag is, is, is the name of the organization that, that, that organized the penal system, uh, much of which were labor camps. By the way, we just got, uh, my sweetheart Suzanne and I just went to the um, uh, Alcatraz tour a couple of days ago down here in uh, uh, San Francisco. And uh, Alcatraz prisoners uh, had to work, okay? That was prison labor. So uh, when you read in accounts of Soviet history that the uh, laborers in the, uh, in the uh, labor camps were, were slaves, that this was slave labor and so forth, this is false. Uh, uh, the prison labor, convict labor is used, was used in the United States, is still used in the United States. And prisoners in the Soviet Union and the gulags were paid uh, they got time off for good behavior. They had recreational facilities and so forth and so on. And I talk about that a little bit in my, in my talk. There's a lot more to say about it. So that there's a lot of loose talk about the gulag being this, uh, you know, horrible and so forth. Uh, one thing is the case, though, of course, the Soviet Union is far further to the north than the United States is, right? So the winters are much more severe, and it must have been very tough to live in, um, in through a Siberian winter. However, there are large cities in si Siberia too. So um, the gulag is often talked about in a very loose sense without any, any grounding in, uh, in, in evidence. And, uh, but I haven't written a book about it. Um, maybe there's a book there somewhere or other. Uh, but Solzhenitsyn's work is simply, is simply recognized as basically worthless. There, I have to say that there is a school, which I think is wrong, that says, well, personal accounts are some kind of evidence or other. But I don't believe that's the case, because people's personal accounts many years later uh, are often uh, have, have inevitably changed. And, uh, you know, your personal account of your own particular experience only applies to you. That's as if it's accurate at all. So um, Solzhenitsyn did collect a certain number of personal accounts, uh, but how accurate even those were is questionable. Basically, his, his, this, the Gulag Archipelago is, is not cited by any scientists, by any, any, even the anti-communist historians. It was very useful propaganda, anti-communist propaganda, anti-Soviet propaganda in its day. OK. So Norma, you're next, Thank you. followed by Rick Johnson, and then followed by Austin. And before we go to Yusuf, who's also on the list, I would like to ask others who have not spoken to please raise your hand. Sure. Okay, Norma, please go ahead. We can't hear you because your microphone is off, Norma. Hi, Grover, great Hi, to have you. Great. Um, was, uh, was the gulag in Siberia? Was that the point of, no, of having? The, the, the gulag, 
yeah, gulag is a term that really means the directorate, the main directorate. Oh, right. But, uh, but it, it's used to refer to the system of labor camps. And by the way, there were also prisons and other, you know, there were other. But, but other supposedly in, in, a, a number in, of them were, but the point is that, that, that most of them were in areas, no, they weren't all in, in Siberia, although Siberia is enormous. Okay. Uh, but they, they were not, right. but, but the whole Soviet Union with the, with the exceptions of a few, a, a few areas is much further to the north than the United States is. Right, I wanted to make a, uh, a reference yeah. to um, Farley Mowat, M-O-W-A-T, oh, yeah. yeah. wrote a book called The Siberians, which to this day warms my heart. His visits, he was invited as a North, Korea, a North American okay. from North, Northern Canada. He was invited wow. to, to the Soviet Union. Yeah. Anyway, enjoy that book, The Siberians. Uh, they took him around a couple of times. Uh, the thing I wanted to make sure you know, I posted two links to local articles, that is, one was here uh, published in the West County paper, uh, West Contra Costa County paper, and another, anyway, several articles saying about how Putin had declared his sorrow at the loss of the Soviet Union. Yes. That it was the greatest catastrophe of, I think, the 20th century or something like that, sure. he said. That, that's one point. So on that basis, I have, well, on many bases, actually, I have thought that the uh, establishment of capitalist devices, for-profit devices, was in order to sustain the victories that had been won by struggle for communism. And to uh, my line about all this is anything, everything for the revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if Stalin is said to have misbehaved, he did whatever he did was in order to keep the revolution going. And on that basis, we have, yeah, we have to learn. We have to learn how oppositional the populace is to giving up its present form of suppression Mm -hmm. <laughs> you think about the U.S. If every if if communism were established here today, people would be freaking out. Oh no! Um, and, you know, my uncle did that. Oh, I'll lose my home. They'll come and take my carpeting. I work very hard. No, really. <laughs> I, I was too young to create the uh, explanation to him about what private property elimination was all about. That everything sure. would belong to everybody, and so on. But that it, the the mm -hmm. devices, the common, the capitalist devices, were were and are have been, and are being deployed in order to save what can be. I mean, what can be saved from the revolutionary efforts. The capitalist monster is a horror, a horror. You see it all around. You get it in the daily papers every day. And if that stuff is what is um, fighting any kinds of, well, you know, what's going on to Cuba? Sure. Uh, what's going on to Venezuela? Those are horrors. If you were living there, you would be in such agony is that not able to explain it. So to, to uh, condemn yeah. any effort that is being made by the socialist going countries it misses the point. Mm -hmm. It is a huge, you know, you talked about it too, actually, Grover. You said the problems, the errors. Theirs are not errors. Those are the efforts to perpetuate this huge victory that has been won. Who would think that a communist, well, actually, I've been reading a book that's talking about uh, that, 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 yeah, a book that is talking about that actually socialism was rising for a hundred, well, I say it was rising for hundreds and hundreds of years. The people were very socialist tended, but they had these masters, these bosses for whom they had to make profit. Sure. And the fact the, but the mentality, the mentality of the people was always in favor of communism. <laughs> sure. 
I agree. One, just let me say very briefly, and not just specifically in response to what you had to say, Norman, and I thank you for your comments, but um, uh, Stalin, at the Stalin's time, and I think for long after that, it was not recognized that once socialism, once the revolution had taken place and socialism or had been established as they regarded it, that it could be reversed from within. I know that um, in his book, I believe it's called in English, Mos uh, um, Molotov Remembers, uh, it has a different title in Russian, uh, Molotov states that, you know, he's not happy with some of the developments going on in the Soviet Union. This is in the late 70s or early 1980s when he was very old. But he feels that uh, once socialism is established, it can't be, it can be conquered from without, can be suppressed from, with, from outside by an invasion or by war, but it can't be, uh, you know, it can't be uh, sort of undermined, it can't disappear because of internal contradictions. So and now we know that it can disappear because of internal contradictions. And so that uh, makes it all the more vital for us to understand uh, the contradictions in the development uh, developments in the Soviet Union to figure out just it doesn't, what, what doesn't, internal contradictions it, caused it to collapse. Yes. It doesn't okay. disappear. The people are still that way. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Norma. So next is Rich Johnson, followed by Austin. Then I'm going to go to the new people, which will be Daniel Bronson would be next, and then Sandeep Agarwal. Then we'll go to Yusuf. So please go ahead, Rich Johnson. Where is it? Yeah, Rich, uh, you have. Hello. To... Yeah, go ahead. Now we can. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I had I had to unmute. <laughs> um, Anyway, hi, Grover. It's good to hear your voice again. And, uh, uh, you know, I wish we could all get out and party down, but, you know, yep. one, the right thing at the right time. And we'll see you the next time. And hopefully we'll be able to yeah. meet you at the, at the library. <laughs> that would be yeah. cool. And you Zoom. So here's my, uh, I have a special question for you. So it's not exactly uh, on your topic today. I don't, well, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's sort of related in a strange way, but. I have been reading a book called, I have just finished it a week ago, called The Stalin Era by Anna Louise Strong. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know of it. Yeah. And uh, my, and uh, I want to thank Norma and Gary, uh, who Gary found the book and Norma mm -hmm. borrowed it and then got, got a bunch of us to read it, uh, or at least uh, we're, we're working, we're passing it all around and trying to get it. My question is, uh, well, what's your opinion of the book of the woman, Anna Louise mm -hmm. Strong? I know she's published a lot. She died in 70, mm -hmm. 85, 19, 1885 to 70. Mm -hmm. I'd never known of her before this book, and she's mm -hmm. got a lot of stuff out there. But uh, in terms of her view of Stalin, it seems very, it was such a breath of fresh air for me because mm -hmm. somebody is actually respecting Stalin, and she mm -hmm. calls it the Stalin era. And I don't know, I, she's gone for 50 years, if she would really agree with your, uh, the Stalin paradigm contrary to the era, uh, I think she might. It, just by the, what this seems to me to be quite positive and as objective as she can be as one person uh, writing about this period, she actually met him, I know you know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, what do, you, what do you think of her writing the Stalin era in particular in relationship to your studies uh, in the, inside the libraries and all that archives? Well, uh... Annalise Strong, of course, was an American. She was she was participated in the uh, Seattle General Strike of what 1919, I think, and then she became a, a very famous publicist. Uh, she, that is to say, she was a, a pro-communist uh, journalist and writer of mainly short books, uh, and she wrote a lot of them, and uh, they're pretty interesting. Uh, they were not strictly speaking historical. They were, you know, they were, they were works of propaganda, uh, and uh, they are interesting. Uh, she was, for some a reason that I have never really looked into, uh, and therefore don't understand. She was expelled from the Soviet Union at one point. I don't know what the mechanism of all of that was, and I'm not sure that she fully understood it either. 
And then she went to China and became a, a uh, you know, a publicist and a famous writer on behalf of uh, the Chinese Communist Party and uh, particularly uh, Mao Zedong. Um, I don't have any wisdom to impart to you about uh, what she says in the, uh, the Stalin era, except to say that she did not fall 100% prey to the demonization of Stalin that followed Khrushchev's secret speech. So she remained uh, a, a communist, but then she moved, as I say, she moved to China and saw China as the next, you know, sort of the next step uh, in the road towards uh, communism. And I must say that that, uh, res that that resonated strongly with me when I was a graduate student in the 1960s. And uh, uh, that, that, that seemed to be the right assessment. Many, many, many people all around the world, including in the United States, saw China as the next positive step towards communism, a step beyond the Soviets, beyond Khrushchev, and so forth. Uh, I should, maybe I'll just conclude by saying even Mao had a positive assessment of Stalin. Uh, he did, <coughs> despite the fact that he didn't know Stalin lied. Now, I, I, he didn't know Khrushchev lied about Stalin. He distrusted Khrushchev and mm -hmm. Khrushchev's assessment of Stalin because he saw that Khrushchev was employing that assessment of Stalin to turn away from certain uh, policies that uh, Mao regarded correctly, I think, as um, leading away from socialism and back towards private property, uh, and therefore is a kind of betrayal of the revolution, a betrayal of the trajectory towards greater and greater uh, you know, aspects of, of communism. Uh, but Mao didn't know that Khrushchev had lied 100% in his secret speech, right? He had no way to know that. He didn't have the Soviet archives, which is what we have today. So that uh, Mao's assessment of Stalin, had he known that, would undoubtedly have been even much more positive than, than, than it was. Uh, and Anna Lee Strong had a, a fundamentally positive assessment of Stalin, despite her own, um, you know, mixed uh, mixed experience and being expelled from the Soviet Union. That's about that's about all I can tell you. Okay, Austin, you. Thank you. I, I, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, I just want to say something real quick, Raj. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, and so uh, I, I want to say something technical, if you mind, uh, don't mind, because it's happening a lot, and I've got my finger on it. I think so. I believe, uh, Grover, that your microphone is what we call a voice activated. So yeah. when you stop, you don't say, uh, like a lot of people do. I really appreciate that. But when you stop speaking, the microphone actually turns off. When you start speaking, uh, there's, there's a break in between. Uh, and the last time, it just happened a second ago, it left out some words. Oftentimes, it starts with the first word you say, and a person can put it together in the head real quick and understand everything you said. Now, it's disruptive. I think that if there's a way you could... Uh, have some a friend or a techie look at your microphone and switch that out so that you're not using a microphone, excuse me, a voice-driven microphone. It would really change your uh, un being understood on Zoom, et cetera. Thanks a lot. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Okay. Let's see how it works. Yeah, I've changed it. Uh, okay, Austin, you're next. Please go ahead. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Grover, I really appreciate uh, your presentation. Uh, I'm a newcomer here. I haven't ever attended one of your, your presentations, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I actually agreed with a lot of what you said. Uh, I, myself, I'm just a worker and, and a political activist. Right. Um, and, and, I, and I believe uh, that you're correct in a lot of things. I, I, I don't believe Stalin was a dictator. I do believe he was part of a collective leadership. Um, I think, obviously, the, the personality cult was problematic. You admitted that, but you you know, you suggested, which I also agree with, uh, that it was a result of historical circumstances and that we should learn from it. So I think, you know, maybe there are areas we disagree with, but broadly speaking, I agree. Um, now, my, my, my question has to do with Trotsky, because I think my interest in Trotsky is my same interest that I have with Mao or Stalin or Lenin or anybody, because I don't call myself a Trotskyist or any ist or ism. 
Mm -hmm. um, I think that we should really learn from everybody and blindly follow nobody. And mm -hmm. because we kind of have to create our new tendency in regards to the United States, if we want to build socialism here. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of my belief. And my mm -hmm. interest in Trotsky, my question is, is that my, my interest in Trotsky has to do with I, I, his, his theoretical positions, uh, such as those in the permanent revolution, mm -hmm. I think really speak to me, especially in the, the current global economy and the relationship that capital has internationally. Uh, I think it really speaks to me about the, the shortcomings and the potential shortcomings of socialism in one country. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear what your critiques or thoughts are of Trotsky, not in regards to his innocence or guilt in, in the things that you, you discussed, but his theoretical positions and policy positions, such as those found specifically within uh, the permit revolution. Thank sure. you. Well, briefly, briefly, a couple of things. Number one, I don't pretend to be a theorist. I do history, which is uh, somewhat different. So, um, you know, that's number one. Uh, the second thing is, uh, so much depends upon your understanding of what socialism is. Uh, if you define socialism in one way, then the Soviet Union built socialism. But if you define it in a different way, then the social Soviet Union did not build socialism. And of course, that means that uh, you can construe the notion of socialism in one country that is as being correct or incorrect depending upon how you define socialism, right? Either, they, either it's correct because they built it or it's incorrect because they didn't build it. Likewise, the idea of uh, that, that, that socialism has, that capitalism has to industrialize a, a country and produce a produce a proletariat before you can have a socialist revolution, which is in one sense at the heart of the notion of, of uh, a permanent revolution, uh, if you want, is, um, you know, has a lot of problems that need to be, that you need to consider. Uh, the parts of, uh, let's say, Germany that, uh, that were closest to Russia uh, in 1914, were not industrialized parts of Germany. The idea that, that somehow an entire country can be ripe for revolution, even though large parts of the country are not, um, you know, have a, either very small proletariat or, or almost no proletariat, the proletariat being concentrated in, you know, the industrial centers, that's a problematic notion. So um, on the other hand, um, there, you can certainly read Marx and Engels in such a way that they seem to be saying that there's a kind of lockstep progression that must take place from feudalism to mercantile capitalism to industrial capitalism and only then to socialism. And that appears to be, that's one way to read some of the writings of Marx and Engels. And if you read Marx and Engels that way, then it appears that Russia was not ready for socialism, that China was not ready for socialism because they were predominantly agricultural countries. And the Mensheviks, at least some of the Mensheviks, certainly did read Marx and Engels that way. So they did not think that uh, the February Revolution uh, should be 1917, which was the bourgeois revolution, should be immediately superseded. They believed that this would be the inauguration of a lengthy period of capitalist development in, in Russia, at the end of which uh, there would either be a peaceful transition to socialism or perhaps a violent transition to socialism. So that the, uh, the way in which you understand uh, socialism and the works of Marx and so forth uh, uh, conditions, how you understand the concept of, <clears throat> of whether you can have socialism in one country or whether you need to have uh, a long period of capitalist development first. Uh, try applying that to China today. What are the ideas of the leaders of China today? Do they, uh, one could argue that they seem to think 
that you need a lengthy period of capitalist development in order to prepare the basis for socialism. You could also suggest, as many have, that uh, the Chinese leadership is being disingenuous, you know, is kind of hiding their capitalist aspirations behind a kind of socialist rhetoric and talking about uh, and talking that way. So the, so this is this is really the problem. Back, but coming, bringing it all back to the Soviet Union. Okay, in the 1920s, it looked for a short time like there might be revolutions in other countries, and particularly in industrialized countries, and that didn't happen. So then the concrete question, by 1922 or 23, uh, was was very stark. Uh, what do we do? What comes next? Let's suppose there is no revolution in any advanced industrial country. Nothing's coming along the path. It's not going to happen. They're not going to rescue the Soviet Union, whatever you mean by that, by having a proletarian revolution in Germany or France or England or, or, or something. Then what? And the, uh, the only, uh, well, there were, there were kind of a number of different paths suggested. One was uh, associated with Bukharin, but there were others who supported it, uh, that uh, you need a long, long period of capitalist development, at least in the countryside, okay, where, um, you know, you let the rich peasants uh, become rich, and then they would uh, provide the buying power to produce a consumer uh, goods industry, and then you could take the capital that was uh, amassed uh, from the, the wealthy peasants buying consumer goods, and you could use that to, the state could use that to invest in, uh, in um, you know, the machine tool industry and the production, of, the production of the means of production, and then gradually over a very long period of time, over decades, uh, the, the, uh, so the, the state uh, sector could be built up and strengthened. And that was broadly speaking, one approach. And the other approach was uh, that associated with Stalin, but of course it was the one that won out in the party debates. So it wasn't just Stalin's idea. And that is that you, you need to, you, that we don't have that much time. We're gonna get crushed if we sit around and wait for that process to take place. We've only got a short period of time that we should collectivize agriculture uh, and we should uh, have a crash industrialization process. And just parenthetically, the industrialization process was not financed by the collectivization of agriculture. Actually, the collectivization of agriculture cost more uh, than, uh, than, it, than it produced, at least uh, initially. Uh, that you should collectivize agriculture, that you, you should have a crash industrialization, and that only that way can you build up the proletariat, can you build up the, the, uh, the uh, uh, means of producing, producing the means of production, that you can industrialize the society, that you can build up the army and defeat uh, the Soviet, the capitalist invasion, the imperialist invasion, which is bound to happen. Uh, one could argue that that viewpoint uh, was correct because that is what happened, and that that the the position associated with Bukharin, which you might also characterize as as Menshevik or semi-Menshevik, uh, could not possibly have worked. But in any case, certainly the Soviet working class of the 1920s was not about to sit around and, uh, and uh, approve a policy that would, um, that would build capitalist relations and maintain them in a subordinate position for decades to come, uh, no matter what. That was the, the working class didn't make a revolution in, in order to, in order to, to do that, uh, in order to uh, support that kind of policy. So in one sense, the, uh, the policy that is associated with Stalin, the Soviet policy of rapid of co collectivization and rapid industrialization was the only possible policy to choose. And therefore, the, uh, the, the notion of, uh, of, um, of a permanent revolution uh, had no chance of success. Okay, so uh, we are approaching 1230. In fact, we are at 1231, but today because of Grover's session, we usually allow half an hour or more. We'll continue the recording until one o'clock. Uh, this is an exception to our 
normal practice. Um, Daniel Bronson is next. Please go ahead. And others who have not spoken may raise their hand before I go to Yusuf, otherwise I'll go to Yusuf. Hi, um, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much for your, for your talk. Um, there's uh, two um, allegations against Stalin that I'm not sure if you've detailed in your work. Um, the first um, I heard actually from a uh, left com um, was that supposedly his wife had killed herself in protest of his policies. The second was that he was um, uh, some sort of traitor to the communist movement because of working with the czarist secret police before the revolution. Yep. Um, what are what are your findings on that if if you've um, explored those allegations at all? Sure. Well, I mean, there's no evidence for either one of those. I do deal with uh, with his wife's suicide. Uh, it's pretty well documented. She had uh, she had migraine headaches um, and uh, shot herself in the midst of a migraine headache when she was just about to graduate from. From, uh, from her uh, technical school in 1932. Um, there's, of course, nobody was sitting there, you know, interviewing her when she was, go when she shot herself. But uh, Stalin adopted the son of a, an early Bolshevik who was killed in a plane crash in the early 1920s. And um, this young, this boy at that time, you know, grew up in the Stalin household, and he published his memoirs in the 2004, 2006, and so forth. And very interesting. And he, he relates that story, you know, they came home from tobogganing on the hillside one day and, and on the weekend, and they found that uh, he found that his stepmother had committed suicide. And, and it was because of, um, of uh, <clears throat> you know, her migraine headache, she'd suffered from migraine um, there's a, a book about Stalin's family by a member of the, a member of uh, her family, the Alleluyevas, and that's well known, and I quote from that book also in Stalin, Waiting for the Truth, and, um, they talk about uh, the close relationship between Stalin and his wife, uh, they had very, they were very close, so there's no evidence, the evidence that we have is quite to the contrary of that story. Okay? But there's no question that there were rumors, okay, here and there that this is why she was, she shot herself. But there's no evidence to that. And and uh, the other story you, you, the other question you asked was about what about the uh, one was about his wife. The other was about what? About um, the other allegation was that he was an informant for the oh, czarist yes, yes, secret yes, police that, you know, before the revolution. Yeah, well, I mean, which somehow didn't stop him from orchestrating or sure. playing a large part in orchestrating the biggest bank robbery of all time. Well, he didn't. Uh, that's a that's a separate issue. Uh, very briefly, uh, the czarist archives have been scoured for any evidence that Stalin was a czarist agent. There's a very very good book, and it's only in Russian. Uh, called Who Stood Behind Stalin by a guy named uh, Ostrovsky, Alexander Ostrovsky, and he died a few years ago. It's a great book. It's about the early Stalin up until, and it's very, very well documented. This guy started his research. He was interviewed at the time he published his book. He started his research to try to verify that story, and what he found was quite the contrary. So uh, that, it, that story has never been verified. There was a, the famous Zubatov letter, letter, which is a forgery, and it was proven to be a forgery a long time ago. Even Robert Tucker, who was Stephen Cohen's, uh, Stephen Kotkin's, as well as Stephen Cohen's professor at, at Princeton, and a very anti-communist guy, uh, refuted the Zubatov letter, which purports to be a letter proving that Stalin was a czarist agent. Uh, so no, there's no evidence that he was a a czarist agent, and that story has been exploded for many years. But again, you know, for anti-communist reasons, you you hear this kind of thing. Okay, so there are two people raised hands, uh, but uh, they have spoken once before. So 
since there's nobody that I see, let me do this. I'll put myself in ahead of them. Sure. Because I, I want to actually raise the issue that recently Beda Bratta raised about uh, democratic reform. Mm -hmm. uh, I read uh, carefully what Lenin was saying in the second uh, trade union debate. Mm -hmm. I think it was in the second. And the question was about the masses. I mean, can they participate, yeah. the workers at large? And Lenin said, you know, it is not possible because mm -hmm. the transition is taking place and, mm -hmm. and we are a backward country, but mm -hmm. it's true also in much more imperialist, uh, advanced capitalist countries mm -hmm. that workers are infected with ideologies mm -hmm. of capitalism and feudalism. Yeah. And therefore, it had to be the party that carries the spirit of the class, at least for the time being. Yeah. And uh, so therefore, but he said the way it will work is uh, feedback coming through both peasants and workers union mm -hmm. back to the party. Mm -hmm. And it is not a one way street, the party mm -hmm. di dictating, but it's a, it's kind of, he gave it analogy of the truck and its transmission. Mm -hmm. So uh, from that time to Stalin's times of reform uh, in which if I understood correctly from your writing, mm -hmm. that Stalin wanted the party to become a guide, a, you know, a, a kind of a mm -hmm. guide uh, to the society, not in administration. Yeah. And that non-party people should be allowed to uh, run in the elections. Mm -hmm. But I see also whenever that has happened, mm -hmm a danger of capitalist restoration. So sure. this isn't quite sure. the ideal situation either. We, So I wanted you to kind of comment on that issue because it's not a simple issue that uh, Stalin, was Stalin taking such a radical step yeah. uh, that also had dangers? Yeah. Well, you know, in that old article I wrote, Stalin and the Struggle for Democratic Reform, I didn't go into whether I thought this the, the manner of democratic reform that's, that is embodied in the 1936 constitution, which is really what, it's what you're referring to, whether that was a good idea or not. You could certainly argue that that was prematurely abandoning the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? That could, certainly could be, could be argued. I didn't see those, that particular um, language used in the discussions at the time but uh, I could imagine that it, that it could have been and probably, possibly, possibly it was. Uh, sure, so I, I also call that article Stalin and the Struggle for Democratic Reform. Uh, clearly, uh, Stalin and, uh, and his closest associates were, uh, did not have um, any guarantee that the reforms that they suggested Letting, for uh, would would uh, would strengthen socialism. For example, they uh, in the 1936 Constitution it states that popular organizations, not only workers' organizations but other organizations, could nominate candidates for the uh, Soviets, and that uh, there had to be a plurality of candidates that is contested elections, and that um, that the rep that the election should be equal. That is to say the vote of one worker should be, um, uh, should count as much as the vote of one peasant. Whereas in the 1924 constitution, the votes of uh, workers counted much more than the votes of, of peasants. And that was an attempt obviously to, to on the one hand, uh, uh, maintain uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat and on the other hand to, to draw uh, more and more people into the political process. So I'm not suggesting in that article or anywhere else that had Stalin's ideas um, prevailed that, that we would have had the solution to, um, uh, to the problem of democracy, which broadly speaking perhaps might, be, might be characterized as, as what is the relationship between the people who wield political power and the people who you know who wield, who who either wield less of it or who are politically uh, inactive, right? There's a whole range of levels of activity of political activity 
in any population. And the question, what are the, what are the relationships here among different people? I don't think that they resolved that problem, and I'm not claiming that Stalin resolved them in his striving for a more democratic system. You could even characterize the system described in the 1936 Constitution, which, by the way, was never implemented. They never did have contested elections. Uh, there was opposition to it. Uh, but uh, had, it been, had it been implemented, or you could judge it just from what it says on the page, you could describe that as social democratic in some sense. That is to say, it doesn't seem, you could say that that's not really compatible with, uh, with the uh, dictatorship of the proletariat, with uh, moving in a, in a communist direction. Uh, I, th I think that this program of 1947, which I do um, plan to write about and to translate, um, dealt with that issue, you know, to some extent, uh, to some extent, but that's right. Um, that's right. Uh, I don't, I think that, that uh, uh, there's no point in saying, you know, if Stalin's ideas had only succeeded and he hadn't died when he was 74 years old in 1956 and so forth and so on, that, that everything would have been fine, that everything would have gone smoothly. Uh, I think we have a lot to learn from the Soviet experience. Uh, and uh, Stalin was certainly wanted democracy, but what do you mean by democracy and how, you can, how can you implement it? That's a very, very good question. I mean, Stalin and the Stalin leadership uh, uh, were contradictory over whether or not socialism had been achieved by, 19, by the middle 1930s. You know, sometimes they said it had been achieved, sometimes they said it hadn't been achieved. They clearly were not, were not sure about that. So we have a lot to learn from studying the history of uh, the Soviet experience but it, it does not provide a blueprint for the future. And by the way, one of the things I think that Stalin was, um, was incorrect about is that if you under, is the, his, his, he seems to have had the belief that if you read Lenin's works in the right way, you can find a blueprint for moving from capitalism through socialism towards communism. And I really don't think that that's true. And I don't think it could be true. I don't think that Lenin could possibly have uh, had known how, to, how best to do that. Um, but Stalin seems to have thought that he did. And, um, and Lenin, of course, seems to have thought that Marx and Engels had some kind of blueprint in mind as well. So, you know, there's a, this whole idea of, uh, of, of, of trusting implicitly in the great works just under, you know, that, that the secret, that, that, that the problem of the present is understanding what the great thinkers of the past have thought. Uh, there's a lot wrong with that. Uh, you know, you have to innovate. You have to face the new circumstances with new ideas. And you need to learn from, from the great Marxist Leninists of the past, but, uh, but by simply imitating them is, is not going to work. Okay, you should, thank you. Yusuf, you're next. Please go ahead. Um, yes, uh, uh, could you uh, uh, speak uh, e that regardless of the specifics of the charges against Trotsky and the specifics of uh, Trotsky's um, uh, theoretical points, uh, uh, I find him uh, uh, recklessly uh, and quite in the open uh, disrupting party discipline uh, uh, and uh, at a very crucial uh, 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 juncture. Uh, so, uh, we, would you uh, agree with this, and uh, uh, would you care to address it? Well, sure. Um, it's clear that Trotsky wanted to be the leader of the Soviet Union after Lenin, okay? Uh, and it's clear that he lied a good deal uh, in trying to further that ambition. Now, you might say, perhaps a Trotskyist would say, I don't really know, but one might say that, well, if he was right, then, uh, you know, then any means to that end were, was justified, okay? If he had the right ideas and if socialism would only succeed in the Soviet Union if Trotsky became the leader, then, uh, then all of this um, sort of planning and plotting and conniving behind the scenes and uh, various forms of lying and dishonesty and forming factions when they were forbidden and stuff like that, you know, might have had some, might have had, might have been justified. I'm not saying that. Uh, what I don't want to get into is trying to psychoanalyze and try to think, you know, trying to say, 
well, what what was wrong with Trotsky's you know, mind? It's it's for sure that Trotsky uh, lied uh, on a grand scale. And uh, my very first book about Trotsky, which is called Trotsky's Lies, in that book, I don't use any Soviet sources. Uh, I only use Trotsky's writings and the stuff that he claimed to be reading so that you can even set, you can even take the position that, well, I don't trust Soviet sources, which I think is a stupid position, but you know, an, an indefensible position. But, but if you take that position, you can still see that Trotsky lied all the time. You know, he had a, <laughs> a, a clearly he thought on some level that uh, in order for his idea, in order for his ideas to uh, to gain popularity and to uh, gain support, uh, it was legitimate for him to to lie. And uh, you know that's a problem. Of course, he didn't prevail, and so forth. And then, of course, in the 30s, once he was out of the country during the 1930s, and of course, he he lied a great deal more. But I'm talking about about uh, you know not plenty, not not not. You can prove that he was lying on a grand scale without reference to Soviet sources simply by reading his own, uh, what his own writings and then comparing it to what he claimed his sources were. And I do that in that book, Trotsky Lied. And what, that was an eye opener for me. In other words, I, at the time that I was writing that, researching that book, um, the, uh, the wealth of primary source information about Trotsky had not yet come out of the Soviet archives, or at least I didn't know about it. Uh, so I was just researching those statements of Trotsky's that could be checked from the, uh, the materials available in the West that we had at that time. And I was, I said, quite surprised to find that Trotsky was, was you could prove that Trotsky was lying uh, a great deal. And, uh, and it was not even clear to me why he was doing it. Uh, in some cases, and what he had, what he thought he had to gain. So, so it was clear to me that Trotsky uh, uh, believed that the future of world communism and the Soviet Union depended upon his becoming the leader, uh, uh, the leader of the Communist Party, the, his becoming Lenin's successor. And uh, it has to be at least, I mean, that can be that that's that's clear because of the you can prove that he was uh, lying and conniving to to do that and then it becomes somewhat more more understandable that that we've discovered more and more and more lies of Trotsky's uh, as the Soviet archives have opened up somewhat more and it's also consistent with what the testimony at the Moscow trials about Trotsky's uh, Trotsky's uh, secret plans have been so um, uh, in my view, uh, you know, Trotskyism as a political movement has been exploding. Uh, if you pay attention to this evidence, uh, it just can't be rationally uh, defended. Uh, I have nothing against Trotsky in any kind of personal way, and I'm also not trying to defend Stalin. I'm trying to defend anybody. I'm trying to get at the truth. But very often when you say something like, Stalin didn't commit such and such a crime, or Trotsky did commit such and such a crime, people think not that you're trying to discover the truth, but that you're, you have a preconceived bias, that you're pro-Stalin, that you're anti-Trotsky. I'm not pro-Stalin or anti-Trotsky. I mean, I'm interested in finding the truth. But it can be difficult to persuade people of that. And that was really one of the important themes of my talk today, uh, the need to be objective, the need to get at the truth and not, not go out there and, and look for uh, snippets of, of evidence that, that appear to confirm your own bias, not to fall prey to confirmation bias, which I think is, is very, very widespread on the left among people who don't recognize it at all. They're not really out looking for the truth. They're out, to find con out trying to find confirmation for their own ideas. And that's, we're never going to get anywhere that way. Trian Kainaru. Yes, I have a, a question. Uh, sanctions. You know, the early Soviet state, I, have you done research on how the West put sanctions on uh, uh, the Soviet state? I'm uh, aware of it. No, I haven't done research on it. Um, what I understand, there were sanctions up pretty much all through it mm -hmm. to affect the development. I mean, mm -hmm. you saw in the, uh, what, the 70s and 80s, uh, the time mm -hmm. period, 
there was some trade and uh, mm -hmm. businesses, U.S. business going there and, and uh, trade that. But I, I think pretty much everything was sanctioned, just like what we're seeing is happening in Cuba. Mm -hmm. They wanted to strangle socialism mm -hmm. uh, in, like they're doing in Cuba and Venezuela. They'll make it look bad just to undermine it any way they can. And, the, and I believe since that was happening, the, the famine that hit, you know, having sanctions, it just made it more difficult for the early Soviet state to get itself out of it. So what is your response? Well, I don't know, maybe it was, I mean, maybe so, maybe you're right. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise, you know, maybe uh, maybe they had more, more trade with the West that would have, um, you know, smuggled in uh, capitalist practices and capitalist ideas along with the, the capitalist uh, trade, the, uh, along with relying on, uh, on uh, you know, on uh, trade with foreign countries and in, in order to, with capitalist countries in order to, to uh, advance, um, in order to advance uh, industrialization and advance socialism. So uh, I don't have any, I can, I, I, I don't, I don't know how to decide between those things. We know what happened, but, uh, but uh, I'm not, I'm not convinced that in a country the size of the Soviet Union that that the sanctions really significantly uh, retarded the development of, let's call what they had, socialism, uh, I think it was. Um, I don't think you could prove that that retarded the, uh, the uh, development of socialism uh, in the Soviet Union. Of course, they wanted trade. The Soviets wanted trade. One of the big problems is that what trade, what did they have to trade? All right, they didn't have a lot of gold. They had a gold industry. They wanted to get as much gold out, out because they, the capitalists, of course, would accept gold. Um, they had lumber, but I mean, a lot of countries had lumber. They had uh, various kinds of uh, ore, iron ore, or, uh, other kinds of uh, valuable minerals. They had, uh, they had petroleum, but it was very, very far away in most cases. They had some petroleum in the Caucasus, so they, Soviet Union really mainly had primary products, mainly had raw materials to trade. And uh, the terms of trade, when all you've got is raw materials to trade are, are very disadvantageous. It makes things very, very expensive. And then of course, when the Soviet Union is trying to industrialize, along comes the Great Depression, right? And the Great Depression uh, basically discouraged all kinds of international trade. So, um, the Soviet Union fundamentally um, industrialized uh, without uh, uh, very much international trade and of course without the importation of, of foreign capital. So one of the big questions that people have about China today is you know, China has decided, the Chinese Communist Party has decided we're going to industrialize all right and we're going to use foreign capital to do it and we've got to grant foreign capitalists all kinds of, of, uh, of, of privileges and rights. In order to uh, in order to get their capital, well, that's uh, that's a that's a leap in the dark, isn't it? I don't want to go on about China, but that's really not what the Soviets had done at all. Uh, may I comment on that? Uh, Certainly, since there no hands are raised. Well, uh, there's a hand raised. Uh, I will come to you if you want to do it, but let me. That's comment. okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So what I know about it and react to that, what mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. if you have differ or have add, something to add to. The only country that they could really trade with was Germany, mm -hmm. because Germany was also outcast country yeah. because of World War One, and and that trade with Germany was very helpful because mm -hmm. Germany was advanced. Mm -hmm. They needed market, mm -hmm. and they sold uh, you know machinery, uh, finished goods, mm -hmm. machinery primarily to build the Soviet economy. Mm -hmm. In, in exchange, yes. they got, got raw materials mm -hmm. and towards which the collectivization of uh, agriculture, which produced mm -hmm. surplus food mm -hmm. soon after, mm -hmm. one or two years later, mm -hmm. was helpful. Of mm -hmm. course, they had mining and other mm -hmm. materials going to Germany. And that went on pretty much all the way, although reduced, Mm -hmm. to the day, according to Kotkin, and I haven't mm -hmm. checked that, mm -hmm. uh, on the day the war started, mm -hmm. Second World War. Mm -hmm. So I think this was sort of 
the only like china for example found an opportunity to do trade mm -hmm. and gave him something the soviets found this opportunity and sure. they used it sure but they used uh, this to develop socialist industrialism sure. that's the argument china is a little different sure yeah. that's the argument i mean yeah. there's this there was this right after the end of the soviet union 1992 or so there was this book published called uh in russian russian book called the uh uh, the Nazi, the Nazi sword was forged in the Soviet Union, That's, and it was all about this trade with Nazi Germany after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, after the Non-Aggression Pact of August 1939. And I think that that idea has been largely disproven. Although, you know, certainly the Nazis got some, the Germany got some some benefit from Soviet trade. Uh, certainly, the Soviets got some benefit. And and how do you? weigh one against the other. Well, the Soviets felt that they were getting uh, value for, for what they traded for the Germans. And uh, there's some research by German researchers which confirms that. Uh, I, I think the bigger question is, has to do with the molotov ribbentrop Pact itself, but uh, certainly the issue of, of trade with uh, Germany is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a question, you know. Uh, what, what did you say the bigger question has to do with what that kind of got the Molotov, lost? The, 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 the non-aggression pact. In other words, uh, some people have okay. the issue of trade, but many more people raise the question of, of uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact itself, the non-aggression pact signed between the Soviets and Nazi Germany in August 1939, of which this trade issue is, is, is an aspect. Okay, so we are at twelve fifty. I want to say, I want to say hold one on, last on, thing. Hold on, okay, hold on. I want to ask uh, Grover if you have some two-minute final thing, or do you want to take one more question? Let's take one more question. Okay, Norma, go ahead. I don't have questions. Okay, <laughs> uh, I have a comment. Uh, we have to know that U.S. lending policies. Sure. crush uprising throughout the world and, and keep doing that and did it at the time. Yep. And of course, uh, if they had not been able to do that, yep. the risings in nations that were constant, would have been constant, mm -hmm. would have been able to continue and that would be supporting the communist direction of many mm -hmm. nations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, okay yeah. so to wrap it up, Walt, you have no questions here? Okay, well, this, he's a buddy of mine and he's okay. been good enough to come. Okay, so to wrap it up. So I think that, you know, whatever, whatever we think, whatever our, or, our ideological orientation, surely the issue of um, the uh, history of the Soviet Union during the Stalin period and, and uh, is, is uh, crucial. Uh, we need to understand the truth about it. And that turns out to be the challenge because there have been so many falsehoods propagated about it and they continue to be propagated about it. And the, the megaphone of those who are, who are propagating the falsehoods is so much larger than our own. Nevertheless, uh, I think there's, there is much that all of us can do to begin to challenge and ultimately in the future to roll back these falsehoods. I've been encouraged by responses from all over the world to my research. There are many people all over the world uh, who feel as I do and as I suspect most if not all of you do that this is a vital history whose lessons we must uh, study and learn and we must be objective uh, and, uh, and discover the truth about them and that, that uh, we are not going to be able to build the uh, better society of the future, the, ultimately the communist world that we want, unless we learn the real lessons of positive and negative of the Stalin years in the Soviet Union and ultimately of the Soviet Union itself. And so this is a very, very important question. I can't think of a more important question. Uh, facing us and we should all do what we can to, uh, to, to contribute towards that end. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to the ICSS, to Gene Rule and to 
Raj Sahai, and to all of you for attending to this. And uh, this is a great activity that you should uh, persevere in, but you need to go beyond this. We all need to go beyond this to the more activist uh, practices that I summed up at the end of my talk. And, um, and uh, I hope that you will consider doing that. I want you to know that I think my books and my research are invaluable at this point to helping us towards that end. I do not make a cent from any of these works, nor do they help me in my career in any way, as you can imagine. Uh, I make them available at, at uh, cost, so, um, so uh, I don't feel embarrassed about urging you to to get them, and by the way, you don't have to pay for them. You can find them for free somewhere rather than get them that way. But uh, I think this is uh, very important stuff that we all need to study for the future of the working class and ultimately of all mankind. And I thank you once again very sincerely for uh, your attention here and for inviting me. And um, thank you. Thank you, Grover. And everybody, we'll see you next Sunday, OK? So I'm going to stop the recording now, and uh, uh, it's uh, 